Greetings to the commissars, greetings to the fighters in South Africa, fighters in the continent and fighters in the diaspora. My name is Marshall Lamini, I'm the Secretary General of the Economic Freedom Fighters. As part of the seventh year celebration of the EFF, the only tool in the hands of Africans to fight imperialism and economic domination, the Economic Freedom Fighters will be doing lectures on the seven non-negotiable cardinal pillars. The Deputy President, Commissar Floyd Chivamu, took us through Cardinal Pillar Number 1, which is expropriation of South Africa's land without compensation for equal redistribution in use. And then the National Chairperson, Commissar Veronica Mende, took us through Cardinal Pillar Number 2, which is the nationalizations of mines, banks, and other strategic sectors of the economy without compensation. So today, fighters and commissars will deal with Cardinal Pillar Number 3, which is building state and government capacity which will lead to the abolishment of tenders. Our presentation today is going to cover various key topics under Cardinal Pillar Number 3. So the first topic that we're going to deal with is what did the founding manifesto of the EFF says about the current conditions about the state? What is the state and what is the government? What do we mean when we talk about building state capacity? What does Cardinal Pillar Number 3 says about state capacity? What does founding manifestos, our founding manifesto says about state infrastructure and state capacity? What does our founding manifesto says about state and state-owned companies as the drivers of economic development? What does our founding manifesto says about tenders? And lastly, we're going to look at the examples that we can learn from the rest of the world in relation to state capacity. Now, let's deal with the current conditions about the state. So, our founding manifesto makes three important observations. The observation number one, the founding manifesto correctly argues that the post-1994 government has maintained the apartheid and white supremacy state, which translated to the majority in this country to become just a voting by the powerless majority. This is true because the people who benefit most from the state is mainly businesses owned by white people. They benefit from the legislation made by the state, tax breaks, incentive schemes, and even physical protection from the police. If you want to see how white businesses are protected by the police, go and protest incentive. The police will come in full force with violence in a way that they will never do if that business was located somewhere in the township. Number two, the founding manifesto is also correct to maintain that most people in South Africa have to engage into mass actions or service delivery protests to receive attention from the government. Some people even resort to criminal activities. People wait for 20 years to receive electricity in their homes, but they have electrical cables that run over their houses. The day they decide to help themselves and connect into the grid, that is the day ESCOM or the municipality will be in their doorstep to respond. Lastly, our founding manifesto correctly says that the post-1994 government has weakened its capacity to provide services, drive economic growth and development. Virtually, all functions that the state should be performing are being performed by the private sector and corporations. That often collude to mirror the state of the little resources and that we collect from the taxes. So, people in South Africa, they think that COVID-19 has exposed the fact that the state has no capacity, none whatsoever. It is a known fact that the EFF made these arguments as early as 2013. At the beginning of the COVID-19 and the lockdown, the government had to ban the export of PPEs because the companies chose to sell to their international buyers who were prepared to be paying the highest, uh, the highest amounts. Local manufacturers were exporting to Dubai and China. If the state could produce its much-needed health essentials, local companies could continue to export while the state continues to manufacture for local use. As the EFF, we've always called for more local manufacturing of cars, and we also say that DINEL should use its capacity and prioritize in producing ambulances instead of fighter jets. If they listened to the EFF today, we wouldn't be talking about those scooters in the Eastern Cape. Between 2009 and 2019, the economic growth globally averaged 3%, while South Africa averaged 1.4% in the same period. We entered 2020 in a recession. 
South Africa's 29 economic, economy grew about 0.2%, and this was the lowest since the 2008 financial crisis. There is an always attempt to blame South African stagnant economy on global conditions, but this is not true. The fact of the matter is that the state does not know how to grow the economy and they have not put in place any believable plan. So now let us look at what is the state and what is the government. The question of what is the state is important, is an important question that occupies many scholars and different theories are out there. As the EFF, we draw our inspiration from the broad Marxist, Leninist, and Fanonian schools of thought in our analysis of the state. While these debates about the state and the theories of the state are important, we must be careful not to be too academic and theoretical in the way that we analyze the state and proposals on what is to be done to build the state capacity. Because if we are not careful, we will lose touch with the reality and we will not resonate with the fighters on the ground who remain the heartbeat and the lifeblood of our movement. But also the other reason we must avoid being too academical and theoretical is to avoid being statism, a belief that the state should control everything. So there are people in the academia, especially liberals and right-wingers, who believe that the EFF is wanting to control everything. This is done deliberately to mischaracterize the EFF and what the EFF stands for. They do this to scare people from joining or voting the EFF. But this is, not the, this is based on nothing but intellectual laziness and shallowness. So fighters, we must not waste our time with those distractions. At this point, what is important is that, what is important to understand is that the state is made up of a group of institutions and organizations that are socially constructed and their functions are to implement the programs and decisions taken by institutions like parliament costs and courts in the interest of all of us. While it is important to appreciate that it is difficult to define the state, mainly because it is political and it involves people, our founding manifesto says the EFF will condense political power to capture the state and transform the economy. The reality, though, is that we cannot transform the economy without the state. The idea that the economy and the state are separate is done so, so that we continue engaging on wrong fights, the two cannot be separated. Those who believe that the state must not be involved in the economy or in the markets are purely misleading us. Look at what happens at the banks, companies, and everyone else when, they impose, uh, when the government imposes a lockdown. The private sector needed the state the most for an economy that benefits them. Now let us define what is the government. The government is an executive led by the president, government departments, state-owned entities, like national, provincial, and local municipalities. So what do we mean when we talk about state capacity? To put it in such a way that we all understand, let us all agree that when we talk about state capacity, we are talking about the ability to enforce law and order, collect and allocate taxes, and deliver services to all people. But what is important here is that the state must be able to do all these things in such a way that the economy grows and we can redistribute economic benefits to the majority of the people instead of, instead of benefiting just the few. The state capacity, it means that we must be, the state must be able to eliminate poverty, unemployment, and improve the lives of all people. This also means that the government must have the capacity to provide better services such as health, education, social assistance to all people. And most importantly, State capacity means that the government must be able to build and maintain in its infrastructure. Without going into, into too much details, currently what happens is that the constitution that was adopted in 1996 establishes the national, provincial, and the local government. It also outlines their functions. Those who are interested should go and read section 40 and section 45, also schedule 4 and 5 to understand what each three, each three of government is responsible for. Even with the constitution, the post-1994 government has operated and continues to operate in a dysfunctional manner. They steal and waste money and they cannot deliver services. In 2018, we saw the highest number of service delivery protests than in any other year since 2005. Majority of our people take to the street to fight for water, to fight for electricity, sanitation, and everything that they are supposed to get from the government. 
some of the things the, gov the government cannot do are just basic things like maintenance of water infrastructure. In this country, we still have places like Finsberg in Free State and Kian in Limpombo, where, pe where people they still struggle to have access to clean water. The country loses more than 1 trillion liters of water every year. We have a backlog of more than 250,000 kilometers of water pipeline. We have people who still do not have houses in this country. There is a backlog of more than 3.9 million houses. We have more than 350,000 kilometers of unpaved road. There is no capacity or believable plans to deal with these backlogs. Since the government does not have the capacity, it depends on private companies to perform these functions through tenders and outsourcing. We have a government that is occupied with tenders, contracts and service level agreements. They even issue a tender for private companies to facilitate awarding of tenders to other private companies. Every year, we spend over 1 trillion rand in tenders to buy foods and services. There is a lot of money involved in tenders. The system is manipulated, it is full of corruption and has collapsed the state. The reality is that business uh, bidvest is essentially the part of the government and they are the ones who are taking money with de without delivering any services. There are a lot of examples to show that the tender system does not work. We know of the Transnet example, the locomotive tender with China South Rail. That invoice Transnet billions more than it should have been paid. We spent billions on the construction of the 2010 World Cup stadiums. We know of a tender of 200 billion that was awarded to a water purification company fraudulently and 30 million was paid in bribes. Now they are even stealing the 2019 COVID, uh, they are even stealing the COVID-19 the COVID budget and spending almost 4 million rand doing door-to-door -door awareness for the COVID-19. The corruption that is happening in government and it is also happening in the state-owned companies. Some of the state-owned companies has not always been this bad. For example, at some point, ESCOM was one of the most profitable companies producing some of the cheapest electricity in the world. In the early 1990s, Daniel designed and manufactured one of the most advanced attack helicopters, the Royvark, one of the, of the greatest exports out of South Africa. But today, com the company is nothing but a shadow of its former self. They have looted everything. Now, what does uh, Cardinal Pillar No. 3 say about the state capacity? Firstly, to build a state that seeks to drive real economic and industrial development and provide better services, we need to have inspired, skilled and well-paid workers. We need to strengthen our service, our public service to transform the economy and we cannot achieve this if we tolerate laziness, incompetence and corruption. A capable state will be able to marshal all progressive social forces in society particularly the working class, towards the developmental objectives. The first step is to build public services and have civil servants who are properly trained and are well salaried. At the center of a strong developmental state should be motivated, inspired and well-paid public servants. These interventions should be coupled with an increased capacity to aggressively fight corruption and criminality within the state. The fight against corruption should not be a side issue, but an important component of the state apparatus to increase public confidence in the state. That is why our founding manifesto is very clear that the EFF will place a premium on strengthening a revolutionary trade union movement in the public sector, which should establish a practical and immediate bridge through which the working class can be the one that leads the state. That is the only way we're going to create a socialist state. The state must employ engineers, quantity surveyors, project managers, and builders for sustainable tasks. Their responsibility will include construction of houses, roads, bridges, sports facilities, dams, sewerage systems, and more. But on more concrete steps to build a capable state, we must establish and give strategic and financial support to the following companies. The first company we must establish is a state housing construction company. A state housing construction company will help us to provide for our people with spacious houses and will be able to help eradicate informal settlement. Our people won't rely on banks for home loans that will take 
20 to 30 years to repay. With a state construction company, our people will have decent homes with flushing toilets that will restore their dignity. With the capacity to build houses, we will do away with the apartheid special planning. We will be able to build houses in such a way that bring our people close to work, close to schools, close to recreational places. We must establish a roads construction company. A state roads construction company will not be driven by profit, corruption and tenders. It must create jobs and use labor intensive methods to build quality roads. We must establish a cement company. We must establish a state pharmaceutical company. The ANC has been lying for the last 10 years, saying they will create a state pharmaceutical company. They stated that they, they stated this when they claimed that they want to manufacture an HIV AIDS medicine. But the fact of the matter is that the company Kitlapela, that is state owned, is a state owned company, is nothing but a middleman to facilitate tenders and procuring medicine. It has not produced anything worth talking about. Government buys almost all its medicine and imports some of it from other countries. A nation that cannot produce its own medicine cannot guarantee its people decent access to healthcare services. We must establish a state-owned mining company. The National Chairperson dealt in detail with the importance of nationalizations of mine. She dealt uh, with it in detail that we must be able to benefit from our own mineral resources, create jobs in all downstream and upstream mining activities. As a state, we must establish a food stocking company to regulate prices of basic foods and guarantee food security. As we all could see now during this COVID-19 pandemic, where our people are being exploited by established chain store companies that are controlled by the white monopoly industry. Our people now, they cannot afford to buy basic foodstuffs. If you look at shops like ShopRite, Pick and Pay, Spa, they've all increased their food and no one is uh, taking them to task. The food is not regulated. The state has got no say on what happens. So our people, they get exploited and the only we, they, they, are, they are only source of recourse. They are told that they must go and report to the Competitions Commission, which is useless because at the time when they finish whatever that they are doing, all they do, they just charge those established companies a few penalties and saying, no, we're charging you a few millions of rent. It's a, it's a penalty for increasing food prices. But the reality is that our people on the ground, the one that spend that money, that money does not go back to their own pocket. So as a state, we must establish a food stocking company so that we can deal with these issues. In addition to these strategic state-owned companies, we must be able to retain ownership of all state-owned companies and entities under the control of the state. We must ensure that they are all run and managed efficiently. That is the reason we reject privatization and will continue to reject privatization and the myth that uh, where the state is involved, the companies are not functioning. We've always made an example about the, the military force of the United States. It's the biggest and the most aggressive military force, but it's run by the state. So that story that when the state is involved, uh, we cannot have efficiency of running companies or state-owned companies. It's, it's, uh, it's incorrect, uh, but it's been sponsored by the liberals that believe in free market, that they not believe in the state to lead the development, to be in the forefront of the development and be in control of the commanding heights of uh, its own uh, its own country. That is why in, in the 2019 elections manifest of the EFF, we said we must establish a state-owned asset and supervision and administration commission. We have learned from the best international practices and we are of the view that such state-owned companies will consistently oversee state-owned companies and intervene when things go wrong. We will not have a situation where in state-owned companies collapsed and their assets are looted, as we have seen with the current state-owned companies. Even now, ESCOM, uh, some, of the, some of the assets are being looted, companies are being overpaid, and no one is, uh, is, is, is willing to account. They just overpay billions of rents to, to companies of their friends and their cronies. So we must avoid that. 
So when the Minister of Finance presented his budget in February this, this year, he reported that the government has issued guarantees to SOEs that stands at more than 500 billion. Majority of those guarantees were for ESCOM at more than 300 billion. But what he has not said to us or explained to us as a country is why the government has also issued guarantees to independent power producers at a tune of 146 billion. And now during the COVID-19 pandemic, part of the 500 billion propaganda that was announced by Cyril Ramaphosa, he announced it as an economic support package, which included a 200 billion loan scheme guarantee, meaning that private companies who borrow the money from the banks, and those private companies, we know it's white companies, if they fail to pay the, the if they fail to pay the banks, taxpayers will have to cover the debt. Government guarantees are what when state-owned companies or entities when borrow when they borrow the money and the government must make a commitment that should those state-owned companies fail to pay the money, the government will intervene. Now let us look at what is the founding manifest of the EFF says about state infrastructure and maintenance capacity. Majority of infrastructure in South Africa is old. And it is collapsing because it is collapsing before it even reaches its own lifespan. The collapse is due to poor maintenance. Majority of infrastructure in the provinces and the municipalities was designed for a very few white minorities. And the ANC government has not been able to build additional infrastructure or may even maintain the existing one. This is despite the fact that between 1998 and 2018, the government has spent almost 3 trillion rands on infrastructure. And this amount does not include the state-owned company's expenditure on, of, on infrastructure. If you add that the total expenditure on infrastructure to date has increased to nearly over 5 trillion rands. But the majority of this money, we all know that is being looted. The Department of Public Works and Infrastructure is the custodian of the state infrastructure. But the department has got no capacity, none whatsoever. Everything is done by contractors and through tenders. The department does not have the capacity to oversee these contracts. In addition to a state-owned construction company, a capable state should have the ability to build a strong and well-coordinated capacity to deliver large infrastructure projects, especially as it relates to the life cycle of infrastructure operations and maintenance. This means that the planning of infrastructure of major infrastructure such as buildings, roads, water purification projects, electrical power plants and telecommunication towers must include a clear maintenance plan. Instead of this, all we see here in South Africa is the infrastructure that is collapsing. Only when that infrastructure is collapsed, you will see people running around trying to fix the infrastructure when there was no maintenance or even a maintenance plan that was put in place. The maintenance plan, it should have a detailed budget. It should say how many number of jobs that will be created, when will the infrastructure be maintained, and there must be a clear detailed report that the public can access to see how their infrastructure is built and maintained. Because at the end of the day, the state is using the money of the taxpayers, so it is our infrastructure. So we must know and we must, uh, there must be clarity and there must be accountability on how it gets maintained. Now, what do we say uh, in the EFF, our founding manifesto, when it comes to state and state-owned companies as drivers for economic development? All SOEs must be repositioned to play a central role in building of state capacity. To drive the real economic growth and industrial development, it requires a strong state with the ability to develop a clear strategic vision and be able to implement and monitor progress. A strong developmental state should have a political power and a technical capacity to give developmental mandates to state-owned enterprises and private corporations. SOEs and private sector compliance with the state's developmental targets should not be voluntarily. You must not decide, it must be mandatory that as a state we are pursuing developmental uh, programs, so everyone must comply. To drive the real economic growth will require amendment of various legislation. Important among them is the Public Finance Management Act, 
the municipal the municipal finance management act to compel national provincial and state owned entities to procure 80% of all goods from local producers and minimum of 50% of these products they must be procured from the companies that are 50% minimum owned by owned and controlled by women and the youth the government cannot depend on big business to revive the manufacturing sector the government must use state procurement decisively in all spheres of government. It now it is currently estimated at around 1 trillion rands annually to enable industrialization. Existing or new SOEs must produce things that the government buy and are used by all government departments or items which government spends a lot of money on. All government departments at national, provincial and local spheres, state-owned entities and judiciary, they buy cars and petrol. Therefore, an SOE like Denel, with a sophisticated capacity, must be established to manufacture cars in a labor-intensive yet efficient manner. The government spends billions every year to buy linen for different purposes. It's either for uniforms, for bedding, or for clothing for patients in hospitals. Another SOE must be established to manufacture linen. Both car and uh, linen manufacturing companies must manufacture for government departments, including SOEs. Now, what do we say about tenders? The founding manifesto of the EFF is clear on its pronoun pronunciation when it comes to the issues of tenders. So far, we have talked about state and government capacity. The other part of the cardinal pillar number three is that we must build state capacity and government capacity in order to abolish tenders. To abolish tenders, we require an amendment to the current legislation and introduction of new legislation. Legislation to abolish tenders must provide an overall framework of insourcing of services, that the current state and the government need regularly to deliver services. The legislation will replace the current system of wholesale outsourcing of services and functions requested by the state and also to address administrative problems created by outsourcing corruption in the tender system and improve quality and accountability in service delivery. In sourcing legislation should clearly prescribe services, outline clear limits of outsourcing and must also provide job security. So it must be clear that there is no tender for cleaning services. There is no tender for security guard services. There can be a tender for gardening no tender for banking services, no tender for IT services, catering, travel services, and in particular, in building and maintaining of the government infrastructure. When we call for insourcing, we are not saying that the government and the SOEs must do everything, including things that are not practical. In instances where services cannot be insourced, the legislation must provide for a mechanism to exempt an organ of state from insourcing. However, the process to exempt an organ of state from insourcing should be informed by a clear criteria which will not be easily manipulated for political and corrupt means. The, these should include the interest of national security, prescribed services only needed, to, can, only needed can be obtained from international supply or if it's for, or it is for the public interest. There are also other services which government departments and other SOEs outsource to third-party service providers. For example, in 2016, the National Treasurer awarded a transversal contract to Vodacom for 20 government departments with a high telecommunication span. The contract was for Vodacom to deliver cell phone services, airtime, data, and overall infrastructure. A transversal contract is a contract that is facilitated by the National Treasurer centrally for goods or services that are required by one or more government departments and SOEs. Other examples of transversal contracts that the National Treasury has facilitated for various provinces and departments include a tender for medical equipment, courier services, and vaccines. To remove these barriers, we must pass laws to establish intrastate procurement whereby a government department or an SOE cannot go out and tender services that can be procured from a government department or another SOE. The legislation must allow for a standing memorandum of authority between an entity that provides services and all other departments or SOEs that needs the same services. We must abolish the use of consultants in all spheres of government. 
the government technical advisory services and agents of the national treasury must be formally established through an act of parliament as a schedule three national public entity and report directly to the president. GATC must build internal capacity and stop using consultants who charge exorbitant fees to offer strategic advices. So fighters, what can we learn from the rest of the world when it comes to the issues of state capacity? When we talk about building state capacity, fighters must not think that we are making things up. Fighters must look at international practices, historically and present, and learn from countries that have built state capacity and not depend on tenders and private sector. China for one. China have today committed that to the centralization of the commanding heights of the economy under the control and the command of the state. The China, China is a state-owned bank, the People's Bank of China functioning as both the Central Bank of China and is the, as the only commercial bank. There are six other state-owned commercial banks in China. The Central Government of China operates a railway system of China and runs the largest high-speed high railway system in the world with over 35,000 kilometers. China's state-owned construction company has seven listed companies and has more than 100 secondary holding subsidiaries. China's state-owned company has built over three quarters of airports, three quarters of satellite launch bases. And now, interestingly, one of every 25 Chinese live in the house that was built by the Chinese state-owned construction company. So it is doable. China is not the only example, Germany. KFW is a state-owned developmental bank formed in 1948. It is 80% owned by the federal government and 20% owned by the states of Germany. In 2018, it became the third biggest bank. KFW holds shares in several other corporations in Germany and in other parts of the world. DB Group is one of the world's leading mobility and logistics companies. It employs around 338,000 people across the world and about 211,000 people in Germany. The federal government of Germany is a single shareholder. It operates and owns the largest railway infrastructure in Europe. It further carries 2 billion passengers a year on average. Now let's go to the Latin America and Brazil. The Central Bank of Brazil has the monetary, regulatory and also supervisory authority in the banking sector. Banco de Brazil is a 75% government-owned and is the largest bank in terms of assets in Brazil and in all Latin America and in total, the government of Brazil owns five banks. Petrobras is a Brazilian petroleum, co petroleum corporation which operates in six business areas. It controls oil and energy assets in 16 countries in the world. The government of Brazil has 54% direct ownership of Petrobras and the Brazilian Development Bank and also Brazilian Sovereign Wealth Fund owns 5%, bringing the state to a direct and indirect control of 64% of that company. In Ethiopia, here in the continent, the government enacted the legislation allowing public-private partnership as a strategy to integrate and capacitate the state in concrete terms. The state-owned commercial bank of Ethiopia dominates the market in terms of assets deposits, bank branches, and total banking workforce. The Ethiopian Railway Cooperation is a national railway operator. It is under the regulation of the Minister of Transport and primarily deals with the passenger and freight transport. The Ethiopian Construction Works Cooperation is governed by the Minister of Public Enterprises. It deals with water infrastructure construction, transport infrastructure, building infrastructure, irrigation dams, and water wells and deep water wells. In the United Kingdom, the network rail is the owner and infrastructure manager of the majority of rail networks. It is a public body under the Department of Transport. Now fighters, let's deal with the terms that we've always had year after year from the Auditor General. The terms that have been used in this country to loot the public purse. They will tell you about irregular expenditure fruitless and unauthorized expenditures but let us start by defi defining some of these terms that they use uh, when they want to steal the money of the taxpayers let's start by irregular expenditure 
says irregular expenditure is an expenditure that was not incurred in the manner that is prescribed by the legislation. Fruitless and wasteful expenditure, it refers to an expenditure that could have been avoided has reasonable steps has been has reasonable steps been taken. Unauthorized expenditure refers to an expenditure that is incurred that is incurred without provision having been made for it in the budget approval. Now between 2012 and 2019, national and provincial government reported a total of 266 billion in irregular expenditure, 6.9 billion in fruitless and wasteful expenditure and 4.9 billion in unauthorized expenditure. This is a total of 278 billion rands. These figures do not include municipality and other major state-owned companies like Transnet and ESCO. And most of these transactions were facilitated through the tender system, a collision between dishonest politicians, public servants, and corrupt business people. So fighters, that is why the EFF Cardinal Pillar number three, it talks of building state capacity, building government capacity, so that we can abolish tender, so that we can avoid this wasteful uh, expenditure, this regular expenditure that to date have got, that between 2012 and 2019, the country has wasted close to 300 billion. Also, this Cardinal Pillar, it also informs us that as an organization that we say, we need a state-led development so that we can industrialize, create jobs, create sustainable jobs, close the wage gap between the rich and the poor. That is why we are saying as part of the non-negotiable cardinal pillars, answers to our problems, answers to unemployment, is that we must have a state that adopts and use these policies of the EFF because they are the only believable and they are only practical policies that will change the, the unemployment levels and the poverty levels in this country. Thank you very much fighters for joining us for another installment of the EFF Book Club. Let us stay strong and let us stay safe and let us stay home. Also we want to wish the EFF seventh anniversary the eff is turning seven this year but as we all know that we are under uh, conditions that none of us could have thought of where the country the nation and the world is under uh, the uh, the pandemic the corona pandemic so meaning that fighters we won't be able to have our normal celebration where we go to stadiums to celebrate the seventh anniversary of the eff but we will survive, we will come back, we will be on the ground, we will continue to consolidate the ground uh, in persuasion of a socialist power. Thank you very much, 